Hi, I'm Ariane Sparks. Welcome to the hot seat. With us today to discuss the recent London riots and the impact on the upcoming Olympics is Professor Tony Travers. Thanks for being with us, Tony. Thank you. So there's been a lot of discussion recently about the cause of the recent unrest. Can you tell us what you think caused the riots? I think what's interesting about these riots is that uh, they were entirely unexpected and nobody had predicted it that it was going to happen. I think that gives us a clue as to the complexity of the underlying reasons and why I'm sure it's right to have some kind of inquiry now. I mean, what we saw in the immediate aftermath of the riots was uh, commentators, right and left, rushing forward and pinning their own personal views of the world onto the riots as this being the thing to explain it. So, you know, some right of centre commentators were there saying it's a breakdown of authority and families and, you know, uh, we're all too liberal, we need a more repressive approach. And then on the left, you had people saying, well, it's all about the cuts and uh, inequality and, you know, th their view. Now, that is not to say that there isn't something in some or all of those rationale, those reasons. But I think the idea that any of us know immediately why the riots happened is probably simplistic. It seems to me that this was such a violent outpouring of feeling, not only in London but in other British cities, it's hard not to infer from it that it's the result of 20 or 30 years of, well, something, failed social policy, possibly, inequality growing, possibly, attitudes to authority, conceivably, the way the police behave in particular circumstances, possibly, could be any of those things and more. And so I think that nobody really knows why these riots happened, and that's why they were so shocking, I think, in context. Nobody in Britain even now really knows why. And, of course, as time moves on, we're now a few weeks away from the, uh, the um, riots themselves, you know, there's always a risk people will lose interest. So that's why I think a review with um, sort of academics and others explaining why they think these things might have happened, you know, is very important. One thing I'll add, however, is, that, I mean, on the second morning of the riots, and I, I was, uh, went to uh, the sitting room and looked at all the books on the bookshelves, and I had at least five books on my bookshelves which had titles like Riots in London. So we mustn't be ahistoric either here. Big cities will from time to time, either for political reasons or reasons of the unfair treatment of groups within society or whatever, um, there will be civil disturbances, more than for obvious reasons in, in rural areas. So again, we mustn't make the impression of thinking something's happened here that is without parallel, which doesn't mean we shouldn't, of course, investigate why it occurred. Do you think the police handled the unrest well, or are there lessons to be learned? Well, I think the police... Uh, there's, again, there's an interesting story with the police. Um, you know, the police in Britain are responsible for all operational decisions. So the Metropolitan Police Commissioner in London, chief constables outside, they decide how policing is delivered. Of course, politicians set the laws, vote the money, but the chief constable in London, the commissioner, decides how resources are deployed. So it was fascinating to see that when the mayor of London, Boris Johnson, and uh, actually Ed Miliband, who's not prime minister and just doesn't run anything, and some other politicians went out on the streets, people heckled them mm -hmm. immediately afterwards. And the, clearly there was an expectation that politicians should have done something to stop all of this. Well, actually, in the British system, it's the police who decide on policing. And they, of course, then, later on, the police themselves said, well, you know, we have deployed more police officers, we stopped the riots. So there's an asymmetry in the, I think, the, the way in which the policing and the attitudes to policing and, indeed, the way the system of policing operates in Britain, which is that politicians got the blame, but the police in the end claimed credit for having stopped the riots. Nobody actually blamed the police for the riots or for the early hours of them. Now, to answer your question, I think that the police... I think there's some evidence that the police at the beginning of the riots were understaffed, didn't have enough resources... And we're not quite sure whether to try to contain the riots or protect property or what. 
And, of course, it took two or three days and an enormous growth of public opinion uh, about this to produce a mass, effectively, police from all over Britain coming onto the streets of London, and that killed off uh, all the riots, all the disturbances, almost instantly by the Wednesday of the week where they started on the Saturday. So I think there will be lessons to be learned about policing. And, of course, the whole thing was triggered by an incident in Tottenham uh, at the end of the previous week, before the riots started, when uh, a young man was arrested and then there was an incident uh, where, in which he was fatally shot and then the Independent Police Complaint, Complaints Commission was brought in and then messages got confused as to who was to communicate with the family, was it the police or the IPCC, and all of that. So I think, again, in the cooler grey light of morning, some weeks onwards, some weeks further on, there is a need here too to unravel what happened in order to understand where the policing could have been more effective. But having said all of this, in fairness to the police, I do think police in Britain find themselves with a complicated task in the sense that um, earlier riots in the 1980s were clearly significantly caused by very poor relationships between the police and particularly minority ethnic communities, partly because the police at the time included a number of officers uh, whose attitudes to minorities were clearly, how shall I put it, not good. Okay? Now, as we move on to today, the police have hugely cleaned up their act. In that sense, they're much more community-oriented, much more tolerant, but um, nevertheless, they're expected to impose the law, and imposing the law is always going to mean trying to stop people doing some, or some people doing some things they don't want, want to. And sort of getting the balance in complex inner city communities between being seen to be over-repressive or repressive and over-repressive, but on the other hand, in, ensuring the streets are safe is a very, very complicated one for the police. Uh, and, you know, with the commissioner responsible for operational policing, not a politician, which is the way we've decided to do it here, I think that puts a great deal of... Um, pressure on the police, uh, which normally you'd expect to be handled by politicians. And that, again, thing I think needs to be looked at as well. What are the implications for the upcoming Olympics? There's no doubt that the riots uh, in London and other cities this summer were unexpected, and they have alerted uh, the police and the government and the authorities more generally in London to the fact that the... Olympics, where they've been concentrating on the Olympics, and particularly in terms of what you might call traditional terrorism. That is, it was all seen through the eyes of police officers and others perfectly reasonably expecting some form of terrorist attack. What they hadn't really thought about was the idea of um, classic civil insurrection or civil disturbances, let's say. So what this is, I think, jolted the authorities, particularly the police, towards doing is being aware that they need to concentrate not just on the Olympics but on you know the unknown unknowns or the unexpected unexpecteds and whilst there's inevitably going to be a suggestion and there has been in the media more recently that perhaps next year gangs will use this as an opportunity to have more riots well we can't know that but I think what it will have done is to tell the police and the government and the city authorities that they mustn't just think about the Olympics in terms of one potential form of threat, but that it's possible in a huge city like London that other things can happen and they have to prepare on that assumption. But having said that, I suspect that even so, the overwhelming uh, concentration of the police to do with the Olympics is going to be about um, the threat of terrorism more than about the kind of things that, ha that happened this summer. All right, we'll leave it there. Professor Travers, you're off the hot seat. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. And thank you for being with us. Please tune in next month for our next edition of The Hot Seat.